CPO is proud to be here in historic Bannock, Montana. What's behind me now is the remnants of a once thriving mining town. But although no one may live here now, CPO is here to answer if there still may be someone dwelling in this historic place. So we invite you to join us tonight as we investigate Bannock State Park. I have a lot of people come up to me um, in my other job <laughs> and uh, they come up to me and they tell me about paranormal experiences that they've had. And what I found doing this is that the more comfortable people become with us as a group, as paranormal investigators, you know, the more, the more willing they are to disclose things that they've come across. Um, it's interesting that as we're going to these different pe places and we start talking to different people that um, the paranormal is a lot more common than people would give it credit for. Um, there's a lot of people that will come up to us on the street and talk to us and tell us their experiences. And there's a lot of people at these places that will tell us their experiences. And I really feel that there's not a lot of place for them to express those things. And there's still a little bit of a taboo about um, talking about those things. And so this is a really good opportunity for people to um, come together and to be able to express their feelings and to be able to share their stories and that we'll be able to document those things and kind of um, find find a common ground for for people to be able to share those kind of things together. When we were walking around Bannock it was very interesting to learn all the history that was going on there and to experience some of that stuff and get to see if we could find anybody that was still lingering there and see what they had to say to us. The building I really liked was the Mead Hotel. It had some interesting things and it was beautiful. I would love to see it in its heyday. There is a story about a little 16 year old girl named Dorothy Dunn who drowned in Grasshopper Creek in 1916. And there are stories to be heard that she is seen walking around in a blue dress and she tries to talk to kids and touches them and she has also appeared to adults and it would have been really interesting to see her. Hopefully we'll get something on our evidence. Uh, in Bannock, my overall impression of Bannock is it's very beautiful, um, very old buildings. I, I didn't feel anything there personally, but I, there was times when I, there was places that I could see why somebody would be creeped out, you know, that it did kind of feel like sometimes there, there was somebody maybe watching you, somebody that you couldn't see. Bannock in general is a really neat place to go and visit. It's nestled in a nice little valley, uh, beautiful countryside, and it's, it is kind of off the beaten path, and I think that's really what sets it apart from a lot of places in Montana. 
So we went to Bannock uh, to do an investigation, and the first time we went, we kind of just went as a family to kind of just to hang out and um, check out the place, just kind of check out the site, and it was absolutely beautiful. We were very excited when we got there and got to go on the site um, and kind of wander around the, the homes and the hotel and the schoolhouse. All of them are in really great shape. You can go inside the buildings and kind of walk around the city. Um, it really gives you a feel of what it might have been like um, when there were people still living there and we really did enjoy ourselves and enjoy walking through the buildings and kind of getting that sense of history and what it, what it would have been like to be there during those times when um, it's a lot different than um, now and you know kind of imagining the horses outside and the carriages and those kind of things going past the town. One of the odd things for me as a person that has never seen or experienced a ghost is that I've always heard about people, you know, unnatural death and untimely death as being a reason for spirits to be left behind. But it's very, very seldom that I hear anybody talk about any of the men that were executed here, that they don't seem to encounter their spirits. But I have had one person told me that uh, they grew up in the area and one night they were playing here in town and they were down here at a big house we call the Graves House and they were playing with a Ouija board and they, they drew, uh, brought up Henry Plummer's spirits, the sheriff that was hanged. I mean, I don't know, they were probably children when it happened. But overall, you get adults and children telling you basically the same stories about this building in particular and then quite a bit about the Bisset House as well. Here in the downtown part of the city, we have these houses behind us. They're known as the Gibson Houses. When CPO investigated Bannock uh, last summer, uh, we went into these buildings and we investigated a little bit. It was in these buildings that we caught some very anomalous EVPs. Uh, we actually felt a little bit strange inside there was a definite sense of maybe a, a possible presence. And as we were leaving, we caught maybe an EVP telling us goodbye. On our very first excursion to the Gibson houses, uh, we actually caught an EVP, which is an electronic voice phenomena, in which we were leaving the house and it really sounds like we get a woman's voice that says goodbye. I thought that was pretty neat because again, it correlates with what we were doing at the time, which was exiting the house. Um, these are the types of evidence that we like because it's hard to say that they were a coincidence. We hope that you took the opportunity to talk with us. I'll be ending the EVP session now. This might have, we were confused about which was the supposed haunted one. This may have been it. Do you keep on feeling vibrations when we're not moving? Yeah. But again, like I said, this floor doesn't feel very stable. John. I just saw, there was something right there. I'm not joking. I just saw, it was like a foot. Because it was like I could see the step, and then... It, Who's walking? Holy shit. Who's walking? It was from the stairs right there. Dude, we were both stationary and there was... I know! Those, foot, those footsteps that we just heard, we were stationary. Just don't freak out. Uh, two weeks after John's initial experience there at the Bassett House, uh, we had a great chance to go back, as we showed in our previous episode. Uh, John, Scott, and myself all went into the house, and it was definitely a, a very neat place to go. It was interesting to kind of see John's reaction returning to the house. Going in there, uh, going in the Bassett House for the first time, 
When you walk in, the floors do immediately shake. There's no question about that. Uh, the difference being is that when the three of us were there versus when John and Scott were there, was that John and Scott were standing still and the floor still shook. When we stood still, the floor didn't do anything. And going upstairs was a whole other experience as well. Uh, again, no, the, the house didn't feel creepy in any way, shape, or form. So Bannock was a great example of what CPO believes happens in everyday life. Some people went to Bannock and had no experiences at all, while others went and had extraordinary experiences. I myself had a very interesting experience. One of the things that um, I am going to take away with me from Bannock is the idea of emotional transference. I had always heard people talk about emotional transference, almost having not a vision, but all of a sudden having a knowledge in your head of what an entity or a spirit was thinking or wanted uh, you know and I never understood that until it happened to me you know I there were no words spoken to me I didn't have a vision I didn't relive something I just knew I just knew in my head what the entity was thinking what the entity was feeling and what the entity wanted so I think it's the experience of you know emotional transference um, experiencing that and being able to empathize and understand other people when they talk about this uh, is probably an invaluable lesson that I'll take away from Bannock I think that it will fundamentally make me a better investigator and it will help me communicate and you know understand people better especially when it comes to talking about experiences that they've had with the paranormal. You know, I don't consider myself someone that is easily scared, but I gotta admit, I'd have to think twice about spending the night in one of those houses at Bannock, Montana, especially the Bassett House. I'd really have to think about that one, just because we had such a frightening experience there. Um. One of the main reasons that our group does what we do is for the history. We really enjoy um, bringing the history to life and documenting the history. We, most of us have grown up in this area. We love this area and the surrounding states and we really feel a obligation to record as much of the history as we can. Um, and this gives us a great opportunity not only to record the history, to, but to find out about the people that are living there now or the people that are taking care of these sites now. And it's really fascinating to make those connections between the people of the past and the people of the, the present and the future. One of the beliefs that CPOs holds is that paranormal activity is actually more common than anybody would ever admit. We believe that almost everybody will experience paranormal activity at one time or another. Uh, my experience since joining the group and being a paranormal investigator is, is that these are very personal and sensitive experiences that people have and it's difficult for them to talk about. Sometimes there are people that come to me and tell me things that they're not able to tell others, not even their closest relatives, because they're afraid of being looked down upon or ridiculed. So what we find is a lot of people, as I said, they, feel they have a fear of becoming ostracized by their friends or family. And what we want to do is provide an open forum for them to come forward and tell us about these things. When we had the Haunted History Tour here last October, I had a lady come up to me af after our second night and she asked me if we investigated pe people's homes. And I told her, of course we would. We'd be very happy to do that. And then she asked me one other thing. She goes, well, can you be discreet about it? And we don't, you know, we don't pull up like the Ghostbusters. We don't have an ambulance <laughs> converted into our Ghostbusting mobile or anything like that. We don't have vans with our logo plastered all over it. So, of course, we would be very discreet. But I could understand her fear at the same time. Her neighbors would think she had a fear that her neighbors would think she was completely nuts. So we're not here to say people are nuts or anything like that at all. In fact, we are here to help. 
And the more we hear about these stories of these paranormal occurrences, the more it helps us build and develop our theory and what we want to tell you. Now, personally, some of the neatest evidence that we caught was actually not in Bannock, Montana, but we had caught it uh, a year and a half earlier in Virginia City, Montana. Now, how does EVPs or electronic voice phenomena that we caught in Virginia City have to do with Bannock, Montana? What we didn't know at the time was that we had gone to Virginia City, gone into a hotel, and captured an EVP. But that hotel originally had come from Bannock, Montana in the 1940s. The owner of the hotel had actually moved it piece by piece from Bannock to Virginia City in the 1940s. And now that's where it permanently resides as the Fairweather Inn in Virginia City. We didn't know that at the time, but to have caught EVPs or electronic voice phenomena in that hotel and then later to find out that originally that hotel belonged to Bannock, Montana was really neat. The Mead Hotel was built in 1875 as the Beaverhead Courthouse. It was per built for a cost of $14,000. In the 1890s, it was purchased for $1,250 and was turned into the Mead Hotel. The Mead Hotel has several interesting stories. People have said to have seen a lady dressed all in white walking the halls of the Mead Hotel in a long flowing white gown. People have heard many, many different whisperings, sounds, different noises in the building, uh, especially of children, of the, possibly of the young girls who drowned in the river behind the, the town. People, people that have told me stories of, about encounters they've had, particularly here at the Mead, specifically with one girl named Dorothy Dunn, but also sometimes with another young girl and this might be, and I'm going to forget her first name, but her last name would have been Thompson. She drowned in the creek when she was very young as well. But Dorothy Dunn, she uh, drowns in the creek in, I believe it is 1916 at the age of 16. And many people have encountered this anomaly upstairs, I guess I would call it, because some people have talked about this spirit kind of touching them. I, I had a little boy that must have been 12 years old that was telling me a story that he and his dad were in town and they come out quite a bit and he runs around when he's here kind of by himself so dad's over at school and he runs over here and he's upstairs and his dad's trying to find him and as he's trying to leave the upstairs he tell, told me that this girl talked to him. And these are kind of uh, standard stories that people have seen, this kind of shadowy image or that she has actually talked or even touched uh, people primarily in the upstairs of this building. And like I said, many very reasonable people are having these same experiences, especially with Dorothy upstairs. So many people are describing similar things of a girl in a blue dress that are not in the tour book. I mean, they, they give you very little description of this girl, Dorothy. So they, they are having some experience. What exactly they see, I don't know. One of my favorite buildings that we went into was the hotel. And I just thought it was an absolutely beautiful building. I got an opportunity to kind of walk around on the outside first before we went inside. And I was fascinated with 
just the architecture and just the massiveness of the building. And then it was really great to be able to go inside and to walk up and down the staircase. And you could just imagine the ladies coming down in their beautiful dresses and coming down those um, staircases. And it was neat to think about how that building was such a community center for everyone. They went there for um, town meetings, for gatherings, uh, for weddings. There were so many um, reasons for them to get together in this beautiful building. And it was um, really great to go upstairs. The um, upstairs has different levels. And so as you're walking, the ceiling is different heights in different areas. And it really gives you a sense that uh, the building goes on for a very long time. And so I really enjoyed that. I thought that was a really great um, experience to go up and through the, that um, beautiful building. Mead Hotel that we're standing in here, besides the very ornate staircase behind me, I mean, this is the first brick courthouse built in Montana. And it was built in 1875, and Bannock was still the county seat of Beaverhead County. But in 1881, something very significant happens, and that is the arrival of the Utah Northern Railroad, which would run basically from Salt Lake uh, up through southeastern Idaho and up to Butte to capitalize on the mining in this region. Uh, the railroad never built a spur to Bannock and with the ad advent of uh, Dillon, a town that the railroad had established as a cattle transit station, um, Bannock started to dry up a little bit more with the loss of the county seat. Well, once they completed the construction of the county seat, uh, the courthouse in Dillon, this building went abandoned for several years until the Mead family, Dr. John Singleton Mead, his wife Louisa, and a brother purchased this building and converted it into a, a relatively fancy hotel for Bannock. And it is an outstanding building, beautiful building. But th they would run it up until about 1907, I'm pretty sure. And then after that, you're going to see Bannock is really changing. We've become much more of a corporate town. Into the 1920s, a, a mining company by the na name of I.B. Haviland actually purchased this building and housed their workers in here. They did that with a number of buildings in town. And there are some great records they left behind about housing, you know, four or six men in a single room upstairs here. So they're using it primarily as a boarding house rather than a hotel by that point in time. Um, the building would, would remain in operation as a boarding house so up until about 1940 again. If there's anybody in here, I'd like to try to communicate with you. Um, in my regular job, I um, do some school teaching, and so when we went to Bannock and we got to walk through the schoolhouse, it was really fun for me because I got to look at the older desks and um, imagine the teacher standing up at the front of the classroom. The schoolhouse slash Masonic Lodge was really neat. It's a great building with great architecture. When we went in there, we really tried to feel what it would have been like when we had school children at that place. And even today, the Masonic Lodge is still used by the Freemasons of the area. So one really cool thing about the Masonic Lodge uh, slash schoolhouse is the number 3777. The Masonic Lodge there is numbered 3777. And that number has actually become a mystic, mysterious, numeric code 
for Montana. Uh, the Montana State Troopers have the number 3777 on their badges and on their insignias on their police cars. Um, there's a lot of debate about what 3777 means. Uh, all that I know is that that is the number of the Masonic Lodge, and there has to be some type of a correlation there. Uh, I've seen pictures of when Bannock was in his heyday, if they wanted somebody to leave Bannock for whatever reason, they would put a note uh, on the door of the person they wanted to leave, and it would say, warning, 3777. And what that meant was that they had 24 hours to get out of town, because if you add that up, it equals 24. It was also said to represent the meeting of three Masons, the first meeting of three Masons in Montana in that area. Finally, it's said to be the size of a grave that if you add the numbers up, it was the size of the grave uh, that they would put you in if you did not leave town. So again, it had something to do with law enforcement, justice in the Old West, and the, Mas the Masonic Lodge. Um, you know, it's a, it's a deep mystery. I don't know if we'll ever know the truth about it and what 3777 really means, but it is very interesting, and I know that Bannock has something to do with that. Um, I've been with the group for about four months, I'd say, since about January. Been on two investigations with them. Overall, I, I really like the group. They do a very professional job. One of the reasons CPO does what they do is they like to preserve history and try to inform people of what happens, try to answer the questions that people have about what happens after people pass on to the next life. Uh, when I look back at Bannock, Montana, I'll always remember it as one of our best investigations. We just caught so much stuff in that place. Um, John and I had gone into the Bassett House and had a very frightening experience. Other buildings that we had gone into, such as the Mead Hotel and also the Gibson Houses, just had a really creepy feeling. And we were able to catch several EVPs from those sites. Bannock, Montana, in my opinion, has to be one of the most haunted locations in the West. And besides that, the history is incredible. The homes, the buildings, you have to go see them. It's really exciting. Growing up in Montana, I've had a chance to go to a lot of the different ghost towns there. Uh, and Bannock, in my lifetime, is definitely the neatest place I've been to. I didn't personally have any experiences there. But just being there and experiencing the overall history of the town, the overall feeling of just what Bannock was about, really, for me, provided a sense of pride. 